This is CBC Here and Now. Taxi spat. This building is pitting one company against the owner of another. How can you put a taxi stand in a residential neighborhood? No, no, and the answer is no. What are your real chances of winning Chase the Ace? The math misses, breaks it down. Nature at its finest, right here. Better than a tourism commercial. There's the whales, the icebergs, and of course the weather, which everyone comes to the province for. We will be talking about the forecast over the next couple of days. Some showers, some thunderstorms, but some sunshine too. Oh, and the snow in Lab West. Two rival cab companies are going head to head over the location of a proposed dispatch center off Empire Avenue in St. John. But is that uh, really what this is about or is the owner of newfound cabs just taking a pot shot at his jiffy rival? Now he says, nope, that's not it. Here's the situation. The owner of newfound cabs, Albert Newell, just so happens to live right next door to a piece of property that was recently purchased by Jiffy Cabs. Now that property includes a garage and a parking lot. Jiffy Cabs is asking St. John City Council to approve a zone change so they can put a dispatch center there. Newell lives so close to the property he can see the garage from his backyard and he doesn't like what he sees. He started a neighborhood petition against the proposal. He says he collected 60 signatures. Newell is concerned that cabs will be coming and going from the property 24-7. Cars going up and down the street all night long. Drivers up there all night like changing over. You can hear them with the back windows open. People are complaining on the street they can hear them night time. You know, and they're up there fixing cars Saturdays and Sundays. I like to see them move out of there, move, move the cars out of there. Put a dispatch office there, no problem. But not a taxi stand. Taxi stands going up, people going up and down, cars going up and down the street, and there's children around here. What I mean, there's grandchildren around here. And it's, you know, it's unacceptable. It's, it's a garage, number one. It's our center of maintenance, number two. Uh, we're hoping to have our dispatch offices put there. It is not a taxi lay-by, contrary to his message to the various publics that he is speaking to. No, no, and the answer is no. Now, George Murphy is the manager at Jiffy Cabs. The owner, Chris Hollett, didn't want to go on camera today. The two families have a long history in the taxi business. They used to work together and are now competitors. So is Newell just taking a swipe at a competing business? No, there's no sour grapes to it. This is about my residential house at 99 Winslow Street, which, you know, that is my house, so I don't want a taxi stand in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So... Some people may look at it and think that you're, you know, purposely trying to hurt the business because you're in direct competition with no, them. No, if anybody wants to phone a cab, they're going to phone a cab company of their choice. If it's new, found Jiffy, City Wild Bug, they're going to phone whatever he wants. No matter where you live or where you're at, they got the phone number in the head, that's what they're going to phone. So it's got nothing to do with me or Jiffy or new, found. It's just all about Winslow Street, my neighbors around me. We don't want a taxi stand in the backyard. I think that people will see it for what it is. Uh, I'm not even going to comment on it. I think that um, uh, it is what it is. And I think people will see right through it. So that kind of sounds like ES. Uh, no comment. <laughs> Now, this issue was on the agenda for today's council meeting in St. John's and just moments ago, the application by Jiffy Cabs to rezone the property was rejected. Bruce Tilly was one of the councillors who voted against the rezoning, saying the taxi stand would negatively impact the quality of life for local residents. Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend will stay in jail for another couple of weeks. 25-year-old Philip Stephen Smith is in custody for breaching orders. His case was called in court this morning, but he wasn't there. Smith's lawyer told the judge he's waiting for disclosure from the Crown. Smith is due back in court on August 4th. Meanwhile, volunteers continue to search for Courtney Lake. More than 50 people combed the woods in Paradise yesterday near the Kenmount Road West development. Lake has been missing since June 7th, and police are treating the investigation as a homicide, but no one has been charged. Her family and volunteers are conducting almost daily searches for her remains. 
Well, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons is touting the benefits of an Atlantic-wide team to investigate police behavior. All four provinces have agreed in principle to create one unit to investigate serious incidents, but there are still a lot of details to work out. Here now's Peter Cowan explains. The plan would be to expand the Nova Scotia Severe Incident Response Team to cover police officers in this province as well as the other Atlantic provinces. That team already has experience here. They've done two recent reviews looking at police behavior in this province. Now, exactly how this team would work, how many people would be based here, how severe an incident would have to be before they get called in, well, that's stuff that's all being worked out. The Justice Minister told me today he expects to have legislation this fall that will iron out all those details. But Andrew Parsons says he hasn't seen any evidence that this province needs its own separate investigative unit. So if we can show the ability that we can have outside resources brought in with absolutely no connection to this province, we you know, immediately get away from this perception that is there and that can taint the investigation, especially from the public. This comes down to a public confidence issue. Uh, having had Nova Scotia do the work here, we've had a chance to see how they operate. We're, you know, we're quite comfortable with that. And I think that the four provinces working together give us more resources to draw from and usually at a lesser cost. This regional model isn't just the first choice for the Justice Minister. Leo Berry, who headed up the Dumphy Inquiry, also recommended going this route. He says that by having a regional model, you'll have better trained investigators because they'll be dealing with more cases. The other big question in all of this is how much is it going to cost? Right now, Nova Scotia spends about $800,000 a year, but Andrew Parsons says that the cost for this province should be a whole lot less than that by going with a regional model. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. An inquiry was called last week into any children who are in child protect protection. And the justice minister says that's moving ahead quickly. Andrew Parsons says things are expected to be in motion by the end of September. But it is less clear how that investigation will affect a timeline for the promised inquiry into search and rescue, which was supposed to come after the Don Dunphy inquiry. The Senate is doing a similar review that may change the province's plans we may need to consider, you know, how do we want to do this? We do, do we want to repeat and spend, you know, millions of dollars looking at the same thing? I mean, this inquiry, we, we have a specific fact scenario that really did lead to this inquiry being called, and then we're looking at the general, you know, delivery of search and rescue in this province. So we may need to look at how do we get the information on one, but at the same time incorporate what the feds are already doing so we that we don't have a duplication. Well, speaking of inquiries, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls has lost another key employee. One of the commissioners, Marilyn Poitra, has announced she's quitting. Critics say the resignation is a sign of the inquiry uh, in turmoil, but Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett is defending its work. They really do have the, the vision, the values, the tools and the plan to get this work done. There is no question that we all agree that the communication has, has been um, uh, an issue and that they have got to do a better job communicating their plan and their vision values and the way that they're going to get this work done. Five other staff members have already stepped down. The inquiry has been dogged by several uh, by criticism over its poor communication. Many indigenous groups are critical of its slow progress. Nas National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Belgard said he's concerned about the resignation. He released a statement saying a family's first approach is essential to the inquiry's success. Canadians from far and wide have been traveling around the country on an icebreaker. The Canada C3 expedition is a 150-day journey that began on June 1st, an opportunity to learn more about the nation's history, including relations and reconciliation with the country's indigenous people. This morning, the ship docked in St. John's Harbor. Here now is Avni Dillam went aboard and has more on the story. 150 days sailing from coast to coast to coast, marking the anniversary of Confederation. It began as a journey of celebration, but the man behind the Canada C3 expedition says it's become much more than that. There's a lot of people that don't want to celebrate Canada 150 for good reason. Um, there's been atrocities committed in our, in our last 150 years against our First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Participants have been learning about Canada's history, including the parts that can be hard to accept. 
So we talked about residential schools and that was after only meeting each other a couple hours prior. So immediately it became very real and very intense, very fast. That discussion was led by Marie Wilson, former head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There have been a lot of tears. There's been a tremendous amount of laughter. And there's been a deep kindness um, between and among uh, all the people on the ship. Participants have had an intense 10 days they say they'll never forget. It's been unbelievable. I never in my wildest dreams expected it to be what it was. The Canada C3 project has four themes, including diversity and inclusion, youth engagement, and the environment. But it's the theme of reconciliation that's had the most powerful impact on participants and the message they'll take home with them today. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's. A man who dragged an RNC officer in St. John's is being banished from the province. That was part of the sentence handed down to Gordon Bishop at Supreme Court in St. John's today. Here and now is Gwen Payette reports. Part of a joint submission from the Crown and Defence called on Justice Alphonse's Fowler to make an order banishing Gordon Bishop from the province while he's on probation for a year. In sentencing Bishop today, Justice Fowler said he can't stress enough how rare this is. Among other things, Bishop had been convicted of breaking into the Peter Easton pub in St. John's in January of 2015, and while escaping, dragging an RNC officer with a car. He also injured another officer with a car while making a second escape that day. Bishop's lawyer Stan McDonald told the court that Bishop wants to get out of the province and that the banishment isn't an attempt to make Bishop someone else's problem, but might break the chain of criminality he has been living with and help with his rehabilitation. Fowler agreed, saying it would remove Bishop from the negative associations he has in this province. And Justice Fowler also accepted the joint submission that Bishop be sentenced to time served, a sentence of over two years. Bishop was arrested four days after the break-in and the assaults. Bishop has a 27-page criminal record. He suffered child abuse and has had mental problems. In a pre-sentence report, he says he is remorseful for hurting the officers and never intended to hurt them. McDonald said Bishop just panicked in trying to escape. Where are you going to go, Gordy? Where are you going to go, Gordy? Where will you move? While Bishop didn't want to say anything, his father told us that his son would likely end up in Fort McMurray, where his mother lives, his two sisters are, and his younger brother. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Beware of those giving gifts. That's the message CUPE was spreading around St. John's today. The local union chapter paraded a 15-foot replica Trojan horse to protest public-private partnerships in health care. The wooden horse is in response to the Liberal government's plan to build two new health facilities in Cornerbrook using public-private partnerships. The regional vice president says the care of people in the province is at stake with this type of model because privatization is focused on pleasing shareholders. He says government should contract work to its own employees. Contracting work in using your own employees saves money. So why would you possibly want to contract it out? Two reasons, you're too lazy to manage. The other reason is you got friends on the outside who think that they deserve to make a bigger profit than what they can make if they worked hard in the private sector. A tractor carrying manure kicked up quite a stink after it pulled down a power line in the Kilbride area of St. John's this afternoon. Fire crews were on the scene near Purcell Street and Bay Bulls Road shortly before 1 o'clock. The RNC says there was a mechanical failure with the vehicle. More than 1,000 customers are believed to be without electricity. Power is expected to be restored around 8 p.m. Ice, ice baby, right? Yep. <laughs> Most of us have kind of blocked out that horrible ice we had this spring now that the warm temperatures are finally here, but there are still a lot of icebergs around. Yeah, quite a few apparently seeing a ton of pictures obviously coming into us and the mm -hmm. International Ice Patrol says it's counted almost 1,000 icebergs in our shipping lanes. Some of them are now starting to break up. Have a look at this one near Change Islands, witnessed by Peter and Donna. Back up! I'm all right. I got her gone away. Back up, Peter! I got her gone away, Donna. Oh, cool. Oh, my God. Oh! Oh! Peter, back up! Donna! Okay, okay, okay. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> 
Donna is wanting him to back up, <laughs> rightfully so. That's uh, something to see, That's that coming down and, and the waves that it generates. And now I'm going to put on my mom hat yep. that says this is a prime <laughs> example of why you shouldn't do this. Yeah. We talked about that the other day. We it's did. very risky. Yeah. Yeah, we showed you this uh, mystery swimmer on Friday. The video was captured by Jerry George and his wife near Twillingate. Yep. Yeah, so you can see how easily <laughs> that could happen uh, where that bird would flip and that would be game over. Yeah, and uh, we've often heard of boats getting up close to tip off a bit of ice for the cool drinks, but not a cool idea. Yeah, it can happen quickly and unexpectedly for sure. It, it is pretty good looking though, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But take it from Peter and Donna. Back up, back up, back up. <laughs> Nice. Well, uh, as we uh, take a look after the break, we're going to be talking about uh, icebergs uh, in terms of the winds. A little bit uh, staying favorable in terms of some warmer temperatures. So if you are hoping to check out some icebergs over the next couple of days, forecast still looks pretty good. Coming up on here now, learn all about how to play handball. Let's go.
Welcome back to Here and Now and another another lovely summer day here in the east. It's beautiful. And I love <laughs> the warm evenings. I mean, it's a treat for us right here on the ocean as we are. Yeah, definitely. We'll take every last day and uh, today was a great day pretty much all across the island. Now, as expected, we've been seeing some uh, thunderstorms firing up in Labrador and on uh, parts of the island and have a look at uh, temperatures uh, that have been uh, brewing up. Uh, oh, I think yeah. we have a whale video first. Oh, right, we have yeah. the whale video. Don't we forget about the whale, whale video. Awesome. <laughs> Foolish <laughs> me. Foolish. <laughs> and it is worth the look. Have yeah. a look at this. This oh, was shared wow. with our CBC NL Facebook page by Trinity Echo Tours. They say this was taken yesterday afternoon. Oh, wow. yeah, amazing. It's a humpback uh, just hanging out, feeding on some capelins. So close to shore there. It's great to hear that the capelin are in because it's great for the cod as well. No more stinky blackberries that we've been hearing about. Now they're going to eat capelin. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great shots. Fantastic. The underwater shots are fabulous. Huh. Yeah. Now, All right. what a beautiful day for checking out whales. That was supposed to be the segue <laughs> after the whale video. So there it is. Uh, and there are the highs, and it was a beautiful day, whether you were checking out the bergs or checking out the whales. Uh, 25, the high in St. John's today, 27 in Central. A little bit cooler places like Daniels Harbor right along the coast, but Cornerbrook did get to 27 as well today. 23 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 15 in Labrador City was the high, and we have been seeing temperatures drop off on the other side of this cold front, which is racing through Labrador as we speak, just 7 degrees in Nain, and that front will then move across the island over the next 24 hours. This is a real treat. This is the GO-16 satellite that was uh, launched last November, some preliminary images have been coming down, but now I'm actually getting this satellite data right into my weather system that I can show you every single night. And you can see the detail is just a little bit better uh, with this visible satellite shot again from the Ghost 16 uh, shows nicely these uh, the clouds that have been building in across the island, just some high cloud cover across the Avalon today and in Labrador where we don't have radar. This is really going to be handy in the coming weeks as we track these cold fronts coming through in this one, which is moving through Labrador right now. Now, as we take a look at the radar picture across the island, this is where we've been watching those thunderstorms firing up in a pretty good uh, round of cells just south of Howley and then up across the Baver Peninsula right now. Uh, some lightning strikes uh, from Hamden and up towards Baver just to the north of Springdale. Heavy downpours with this. Frequent lightning wouldn't rule out a little bit of hail as well. A couple other cells, one near Twillingate and one just pushing off of Bonavista North, but those are moving to the north. And so uh, conditions easing if you are still seeing some downpours from those. And again, that uh, cold front that's been moving through Labrador for today will be pushing uh, eastward to Happy Valley Goose Bay, coastal Labrador as we work throughout this evening. In Newfoundland, it's pretty quiet. A couple of showers possible over the south coast towards the Bay Vert Peninsula, not ruling it out for the Avalon overnight. A little bit of drizzle possible, especially as we work towards tomorrow morning. And again, that southerly flow with that uh, onshore drizzle is a pretty good possibility to start the day on Wednesday. Cold front. That's what we're talking about. That's our main weather player. And there it is along parts of the west coast up the northern peninsula into southeastern parts of Labrador for tomorrow morning. And yes, on the other side of this system, that is wet snow possible in Labrador City. Even Churchill Falls, but more so Lab City up towards Shefferville is the best chance of seeing some wet flakes tomorrow morning as temperatures dip to two or three degrees. It's a very mild start across the island. And again, a pretty much dry start for central and east. The shower chances will move in as that front comes through into the afternoon. Any wet snow will mix over to some showers that will linger for most of the day in Labrador. Our high tomorrow in St. John's will be 24 degrees. Still a fine looking evening tomorrow at 18. Scattered showers into the afternoon. It's an isolated risk into the evening. I think we'll be mostly dry by supper time and beyond. 24 to 22 degrees generally in the east. Again, cooler in those onshore winds. And you'll note as the winds shift to west along the west coast, temperatures are going to be in that 17, 18 degree range for most, even a little bit cooler up towards the northern peninsula. 13 in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow. Again, clouds dominate with showers into a high of just 9 degrees in Labrador City. And yes, while we are talking about snow possibilities, Possibilities for Labrador City tomorrow morning. There is more summer in the long range forecast. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Carolyn. 
Thanks, Ryan. Well, two of the best handball players in the world are in St. John's this week. Handball NL brought them in for a national training camp, and it might not be a sport you're familiar with, but uh, fans of the game say it's really easy to play and the best workout going. Here he knows Andrew Sampson is live tonight at the Paul Reynolds Center in St. John's. Andrew. Hey, this is a pretty big week for handball players across the province. They've got two world-class athletes in this room from Ireland and New York City, and they're training young and old athletes in handball. But for a lot of us, we don't really know what handball is all about. So I had one of the pros here show me the ropes. It didn't start out too great, though. But after that humbling moment, I settled down and got into the groove. It turns out that the key to understanding this game is that it's a lot like racquetball without the racket. And all you need is a hand, a ball, and a wall, and you're pretty much good to go. Earlier today, I talked to Dara and Danielle about what makes them love the sport so much. So it's kind of like tennis where, or racquetball, it's even closer, where you're, you're basically just volleying the ball. So you're hitting a ball back and forth to another player, uh, and you have to get it before it bounces two times. So if somebody can't make the wall within those two to within the one bounce or zero to one bounce, then you win the point and the other person doesn't. Pretty much all you need is a flat wall surface and a flat floor surface and you, you can play. The game is played here. We have wooden walls and a kind of, I don't know, a, a sports flooring. Um, in New York, it's, it's concrete walls, concrete flooring. Back home, we play on, on a wooden flooring. So essentially, all you need is a flat floor surface and a flat wall surface and you're good to go. So I come from a small rural town in Ireland and handball is one of the, the few sports that we play in that town. So um, I've been playing handball since I was about nine years old. Um, luckily, I actually work for handball in Ireland full time. So my day to day job is to go around schools and clubs coaching handball, um, developing coaching courses and, and running tournaments. So um, I'm kind of living the dream as such. As, and my hobby is my job. So. Um, yeah, I've been in that job for the past six years and when we in from the Newfoundland Handball Association asked me over, um, we're only too delighted to help. So, we are. so the handball community worldwide, um, kind of everybody knows everybody, we go to a lot of tournaments together, so um, we like to kind of help each other out and, and go to the game globally. We're actually here for just the handball camp that's going on, thrown by Wayne and the YMCA and just a bunch of locals around here that have a, a really good group of juniors and just upcoming players that have done really well in nationals and just tournaments around the country and in the U.S. So just to come here and just uh, maybe coach and see what, teach a little bit of what we know and maybe they can grow the game even more so. Uh, so I actually started a little later. I started at 17. Uh, I played softball all my life and then in New York it's, we have about a thousand courts so you can literally walk down the street and there's a handball court. And it's also played in the high school. So it's a varsity sport in New York City. And a lot of my friends were on the team. And then I decided to quit the softball team and practice from, I got, I got addicted. So I practiced from like eight in the morning to like eight at night, just to try to make this team. And I made it. Three sessions per day. The morning session is for the under 12s. The afternoon session is for the teenagers. And then the night session is for the adults. So um, if anybody's listening or you can feel free to pop down. It's, it's a really great experience and a really good thing to see. Just to have so many families involved and I think you'll get a really like really good friends, really good workout, just the whole package. The National Handball Camp continues for the rest of the week and if you think you have what it takes, Dara and Danielle say to drop on by and who knows, you might even see me there too. Reporting live for Here and Now from St. John's, I'm Andrew Sampson. Up next, plan on heading out to Ghouls tomorrow for Chase the Ace. Our math misses breaks down your odds of winning.
welcome back to Here and Now. Well, there's a one in 13 chance that someone is going to win close to a million dollars in St. John's tomorrow night. And the chance it'll be you, well, that's about one in 1.1 million. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> the Chase the Ace Lottery at St. Kevin's Parish in Ghouls has officially blown up. Yeah. The prize this week is expected to be around $750,000. And with numbers like that, we decided to call the math Mrs. Sarah Smelly to show us the odds of walking away rich. Welcome to an emergency edition of the math Mrs. Tonight we're talking Chase the Ace. As you may have heard, a Chase the Ace game in the Goulds reached a prize of over $600,000 last week. A massive crowd is expected to play again this week and bump up that prize to $750,000. First, people buy tickets, lots of tickets. The money from these ticket sales goes toward the prize. Then, on game night, one lucky ticket is drawn from among all the tickets sold. The owner of that ticket gets up on stage and draws one card from a standard deck. If they draw the ace of spades, they win the game and the prize money. If not, their card is removed from the deck and the game continues next week and the week after and every week until someone picks the ace of spades. Jade Eustace is a statistician. In this game, there's actually two lotteries you're playing. There are the tickets and then there's the actual choosing of the card. So the first lottery is dependent on the tickets. That really depends on the number of people who come out and how many tickets each person is buying. So last week they actually sold about 200,000 tickets. So if you bought three tickets, that's about three out of 200,000. So then if we move over to the cards. There's only 13 cards left, so you have a much better chance there. One in 13 of choosing the Ace of Spades. And if you want to know your probability of winning the entire jackpot, you'd have to multiply these two probabilities together. So you'd have maybe one in 87,000 over here, <laughs> and then you'd have one in 13 over here. And if you multiply those together, you're gonna get about a one in 1.1 million chance. But it's still better than, say, Lotto 649. Yes, that's true. Lotto 649 is 1 in 14 million, so you are doing better on this game. Yes! What's the probability of a Chase the Ace lottery going as far as this one has? Well, we're going on to week 40 now. The probability of the Ace getting chosen sometime in the first 39 weeks is 39 out of 52, or 75%. So then we can look at the probability of it being chosen after 40 weeks, and that's the remaining 25%. So really for every four Chase the Ace games that are run, we're gonna get one that gets up this high, and those are the ones that you hear about on the news. Oh! oh. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> Oh, great fun. I wonder, will they be doing that tomorrow night or like the guy was doing? <laughs> I love the expressions. It's yeah. great. Yeah, I mean, it is a whole lot of money. And as it was explained, it's a lot better than a uh, lot of 649 yeah. odds. So By a lot, good. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the draw happens uh, tomorrow night after 8 o'clock. And, of course, we'll be there. Absolutely. Living with Lyme disease, one mother shares her story about trying to get treatment for her son.
Ryan Mitchell worked in Alberta and thinks he contracted Lyme disease there when he was 21. It went undiagnosed for 13 years. Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria that invades the body through the saliva of certain ticks. Sometimes there's a bullseye rash. If Lyme disease is caught early, it can be treated with antibiotics. If it's not, it can be very hard to diagnose and there's no proven effective treatment. Patients like Ryan can suffer for years from a wide variety of symptoms. Now his family is trying to raise thousands of dollars to send him to Germany for an unproven treatment. And I've reached Judy Mitchell at her home. So Judy, how has Ryan's health been over the past several years? Okay, well, uh, he got really healed back in 2003 uh, when he was in Alberta. And he was like a few months that he couldn't work and very sick. But he went to the doctor on several occasions in Edmonton and uh, they couldn't find anything wrong. So eventually uh, he moved in with me for a while, but then he eventually went back to work. So like he, he just worked like in Alberta, when you live there, you just you just work. So he worked a lot, and uh, but he was always seemed to calm well. Uh, always had like uh, flu-like symptoms, sinus infections, uh, like just sick looking. And but he, he just kept pushing himself, uh, just kept working. And eventually, he had four children, so therefore, you really needed to uh, just keep keep going. Uh, so finally, yeah, three years ago, he just couldn't, he couldn't keep going. So yeah. he just came home to Newfoundland. And I gather from you as well that he had like uh, uh, so many root canals, everything was affecting yes, his yeah. face, his sinuses and everything. Yeah, he had 18 root canals and like that's like dishonored of. Uh, I've always had a lot of facial pain, you know. Uh, when he's days off, most times he had to go to the dentist or to the doctor. Yeah, like when he, he just had four days off most times and he spent them mostly, you know, trying, trying, to, help his, trying to help himself any way he could. So Besides how, therapist, yeah. So how did he finally get the, the diagnosis that he had Lyme disease? Well, he, uh, he kind of searched his symptoms online himself and he was in St. John's with his sister at the time. He came home, he said, Mom, he said, I need you to book me a flight to Calgary. He said, I need to go see a doctor. He said, I think I got lines. So that was in September of 2016. So we, we sent him up there and uh, yeah, that's when he got diagnosed. Hmm. So what kind of treatment has he been getting since then? Uh, with Dr. Riss from Calgary, she's doing Chinese medicine. She told him that because he's been on antibiotics for many, many times over the years, she didn't recommend antibiotics at this point. She don't think his body would, uh, like his body is, was too kind of, his immune system was too low to uh, really take on any more, anti any more antibiotics at the time. So he was doing Chinese medicine. He did that on, from September to March, but then his body started to react. It started breaking out into rash. So, because uh, he used to be talking with her, but like every six weeks on the phone, she would be sending him new meds. But then uh, when he broke up with a rash, she said, well, cut back. But then he took photos of his rash, sent it to her, and she said, oh, stop, stop your, med stop your, remedy, you know, your medication. So until the rash subsides, but then it never did really subside. So Judy, uh, Ryan's been accepted into this treatment program at a hospital in Germany. There is no guarantee it will work. So why has he decided to give it a try? Uh, well, look, we also have blood work done, sent to Germany about six months ago. So it came back that he had tested positive for Lyme. So we were told about a year ago that, uh, you know, uh, Germany might be a better place for treatment. So, but we thought we'd stay local, but it seemed like we have no option now but to just do the best we can for him. How long do you expect he's going to have to stay there? First, we thought it was two week treatment, but I got an email saying that once we sent all the information to Germany, uh, they feel that he would need an extra week to address uh, his major health issues. Hmm. So what is the alternative for Ryan if this doesn't work? I don't know if any alternative. Just got to work. So he's desperate and, and you must be desperate as well as his mother. Of course. I've been desperate for a long time. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, he suffered way too much, way too long. Hmm. 
Mm. So we just got to do what we, you know, I can't let them die in front of my eyes. I just got to do what I got to do. Well, Judy, thank you very much for uh, joining us from Botwood. And um, I'm sure everybody wishes you and Ryan success. Whatever happens, uh, you're wished very well. Yep, thank you. And it's time to introduce you to this little one. This is Clea Inman from Bonavista. Clea is six years old, a figure skater with the Silver Wings Figure Skating Club. Yes, she sure knows how to strike a pose. Congratulations, Clea. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. A close call in the air that could have been a lot worse and could have been disastrous. We'll have that story after the break. Welcome back. An Air Canada jet narrowly averted what some experts say would have been the worst disaster in air travel history. Pilots of the Toronto to San Francisco flight had accidentally lined up to land on a busy taxiway instead of their assigned runway. Air traffic control alerted them and the plane did a go around to land safely. The U.S. Federal Aviation Authority is investigating. Ron Ch Charles reports. This is where air traffic controllers at San Francisco International Airport had directed the Air Canada flight with 140 people on board to land Friday night, runway 28R. But the radio transmission soon confirmed the Airbus A320 was instead headed for this taxiway, where four other jets laden with fuel and hundreds of passengers were waiting to take off. The Air Canada pilots were first to notice something was not right. And, uh, so I just want to confirm this, uh, Air Canada 759, uh, we see some lights on the, uh, runway there, across the runway, can you confirm the clear to land? Air Canada 759, confirm, clear to land, runway 2A right, there is no one on 2A right, but you. That's when a pilot from one of the four planes lined up on the taxiway next to the runway interjects. Where's this guy going? He's on the taxiway. The tower tells Air Canada to bypass the airport and try again. 
It's not clear how close the Air Canada plane was to landing and possibly crashing into the four planes on the ground, but pilots of those planes were clearly not impressed. Uh, United 1, Air Canada flew directly over us. Block, uh, 1501, Air Canada flew directly over us. Yeah, I saw that guy. The Air Canada jet did then land on the actual runway without incident. The U.S. Federal Aviation Authority is investigating to try to determine why the pilots lined up for the taxiway. Former commercial pilots and airline safety experts are also asking how it could have happened. There are electronic devices that send radio signals up to the airplane for vertical and lateral alignment and why those were not being followed is a central question that the investigators will look at. The airline safety experts say this type of error is rare and considered serious, especially since the potential crash involving five airliners would have likely been the worst in aviation history. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Additional firefighters from across the country are in B.C. helping to tame ferocious wildfires. The federal government has also sent in military aircraft to monitor evacuation efforts. But despite all this, B.C.'s response to the wildfire emergency has been a complicated one. More surreal. It hasn't sunk in yet. Like, my hometown, I, I grew up in Williams Lake. My hometown could be, it's completely surrounded in flames right now. More than 14,000 people have fled their homes. Many of them are ending up at evacuation centers in nearby Prince George and Kamloops. Officials say they're keeping an eye on more than 300 fires across the province. About 140 of those are considered active. A former Halifax medical student was given the mandatory sentence for first-degree murder today. William Sanderson now faces a life sentence with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. Sanderson, who is now 24 years old, was found guilty last month. He was convicted for the murder of 22-year-old Taylor Sampson, a fellow student at Dalhousie University. Samson was seen on video walking into Sanderson's apartment in August of 2015. He is never seen leaving, and his remains have never been found. Sanderson's lawyers have indicated they will appeal the conviction. A small New Brunswick community is mourning a man who died while trying to rescue a whale. Joe Howlett, here with his son, was known and respected by everyone, says the mayor of Campello Island. Fisheries and Oceans Canada confirms there was a fatal incident yesterday involving an individual on board one of its vessels. Howlett had been trying to rescue a whale in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. CBC News contacted the Canadian Whale Institute, which has worked with Howlett in the past. A member says the group will be putting out a statement with more details on Howlett's death. A highly contagious infection is spreading through finch populations in Atlantic Canada. It's affecting birds from one end of Nova Scotia to the other, and people who feed birds are being asked to take their feeders down to help stop the spread. Paul Palmater has more. This video recorded yesterday in Sydney shows what the avian parasite trichomonosis is doing to the finch population in the province. The video is being shared on social media and the Nova Scotia Bird Society is recommending all bird feeders be taken down. We want the birds to disperse. We want them to go on their own and do their normal activities instead of being attracted to backyard feeding, feeding when they congregate. Curry says the infection is the worst he's seen in his nearly 40 years of bird watching. He says other species are also at risk, from domestic birds to predators. There is a bird already infected with uh, one of these diseases. Um, a raptor is going to probably pick that one out because it's the easiest target and uh, that disease then can be transmitted to those birds that uh, actually eat it. The society is now trying to get their message out. Remove your bird feeders and bird baths and have them cleaned immediately. This bird watcher in Dartmouth has already taken her feeders down in her backyard. Disappointed, but I'm glad to take an action. I was hearing about what's happening with the birds and something as simple as taking the feeders down. The feeders are for us. There's lots of food for the birds. Anyone who sees a sick bird is asked to report it to the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. In the meantime, people are being asked to keep their bird feeders down until the fall. Paul Palmiter, CBC News, Dartmouth. The weather update is brought to you by...
Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. A few minutes late for the weather and a big uh, shout out and applause to uh, Rod Dobb and Jen White <laughs> behind the scenes who were scrambling uh, as I had to, uh, they had to stall for me for about 10 minutes, uh, some computer issues, but we're back online. We're cooking with gas. Thank you guys behind the scenes there. And as we uh, take a look at your weather on the way headlines, I'm glad we can bring them to you. Uh, cold front showers and storms on the go right now. We have a fine looking uh, Thursday and Friday after those showers do clear out through the day tomorrow and then showers in the mix for the weekend. But we're not talking about a washout. We will be seeing some sunshine on the menu too. There are uh, your forecast temperatures for tomorrow. You can see anywhere from 21 to 24 degrees over the eastern half of the island. A little bit cooler with those onshore westerly winds in the west. Temperatures as cool as 9 degrees in Lab West. Now as we take a look at Wednesday evening where we pick things up, you can still see the lingering chance of a shower in the east. Sun breaks moving into the west and some scattered showers that are going to be on the go here in Labrador. And then as we roll into the Thursday morning time period, uh, still a bit of high cloud cover but that clears, I think, into the afternoon across central Newfoundland. I think the clouds could linger a little bit high cloud that is across eastern parts of Newfoundland as the system passes to our south and some scattered shower chances will be moving in to Labrador through the day uh, east. That is thanks to a trough that's going to be moving into the region. So anywhere from 18 to 22 degrees on the island, but a mix of sun and cloud. And as we take a look into the Friday time period, this uh, little trough line will bring up perhaps an overnight shower to the northern peninsula and central by Friday afternoon. It's long gone and we are looking at a very nice looking Friday forecast right across the region. Mostly sunny skies, 20 to 23 degrees on the island, sun and cloud in Labrador, 21 to 22 degrees there. And as we take a look at the weekend, this is going to be the interesting setup. So watch your timeline Saturday morning. I think we start dry and I think even into the afternoon we're dry. Forecast models bringing an evening risk of showers and if there was ever a time for a system to come through, this would be it Saturday evening into Saturday night and by Sunday morning some lingering showers, but we're cleared out for Sunday afternoon. So it's a pretty quick moving system, but right now it does appear we will be seeing some showers in the mix, but again, the timing does bring them in for later Saturday into Sunday, clearing out for Monday into Tuesday. I think it's been the theme all summer long where we've got some kind of a shower and you should see the look Debbie Cooper is giving you right now. If looks could kill, I'd be six feet under it. I'm sure everyone at home is looking at the TV screen the exact same way. Sorry, Ryan. It, it's okay. It's okay. I understand uh, how everybody wants a good weekend, including me. I've got a deck to finish. Uh, anyway, there's your forecast in Labrador, which again has some weekend showers in the mix. Wow, the winners have been named in the 2017 International Drone Photography Contest. Wow, the work highlights the intricate sea ice in Greenland or the blocky beauty of a tennis court, proof that sometimes the best views come from above. <laughs> Stay with us, we'll be right back. Oh, another dandy. Oh.
Welcome back and some good news for any of you coffee drinkers out there. Two new studies suggest it may lead to a longer life. They found drinking coffee is linked to a reduced risk of dying from heart disease, cancer or stroke. Just one cup a day lowered the risk by 12 percent. Three cups a day lowered the risk by 18 percent. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's decaf or regular brew. How about that? that That's some good news. That is. <laughs> the past few winter storm seasons have anything to say about it. I'm going to live to be 150. <laughs> Ah, and uh, leaving you with another beautiful picture. I mean, every night it's uh, out of the park with these pictures coming in. Uh, this one, uh, I'm thinking, was taken with a drone. Either that or a very uh, small plane. <laughs> uh, but a huge iceberg off Bonavista and Joanne Murphy there. And you can see the, uh, uh, I believe that's a Coast Guard ship. Uh, looks like it yeah. looks like it, yeah, that, the coloring. Uh, for the paint. perspective there. Yeah, beautiful. Gorgeous. Thank you, Joanne. And thanks to all of you. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night, Good night everyone.